Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's Free CompTIA Network Plus Certification Training Course, the online training course that asks the question, ninjas or pirates? I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about network performance optimization. This comes from section 4.5 of our N10-004 exam, where we need to explain the different methods and rationales for network performance optimization. So we not only know need to know how to make the network more optimized, we also need to know why we would ever want to optimize the network. And that's probably a great place to start, is with why would we go through this, in some cases, very arduous process of optimizing the network? Well, one very common reason is that if you build a network that works well, it's probably going to stay up longer. Then some cases, that is your number one priority, is making sure that your customers can get to these network resources and back out again. And if you're building a network from the ground up that is resilient and redundant and well-designed, then you're probably going to avoid a lot of unforeseen circumstances that could come your way or certainly give you a leg up when it comes to handling those things. Another key for optimizing your network is in case you need to add a new application to the network that uses a lot of bandwidth. And many new applications these days are using a lot of bandwidth. So if an application uses a lot of file transfers, they need to do some high-speed data transfers to third party, or a third party needs to drop in some data into your network, you're going to want to be sure your network is running as efficiently as possible. As if you have more bandwidth requirements, you want to be sure they spend as little time on the network as possible and they are done. So that's going to speed things up also with the application. Another good consideration when dealing or trying to understand why we would want to have better performance on our network is with applications that are very sensitive to delays in the network. If you have a slow, quote unquote, slow network, that means that the application functionality will probably be degraded quite a bit. If you're going over non-terrestrial links or you're using an application that's very sensitive to any type of delay, you may have an issue here. So many real-time applications are this way. For stockbrokers who are transferring stocks and buying and selling stocks, you need to make sure that your network is running as fast as possible so that you can sell the stock before anyone else does. And very often in that type of environment, it's a matter of nanoseconds between you and the next company. And you're going to make the commission if your network is faster. So performance considerations becomes extremely important there. When we talk about latency and we talk about sensitivity, one good example of places where that comes into play are things like voice over IP. When we're listening to a phone conversation, those packets have to get to our ear on time. If it gets too badly delayed, there's going to be gaps in there. We may lose information or parts of what someone might be saying. We can't miss. If we're too late, it's too late to, to give us the sound. We can just drop it away and catch up with where it was going. That old data becomes completely useless to us. And in fact, if it's over about a quarter of a second, 250 milliseconds, if that delay gets much more than that, it becomes very difficult to have a conversation with somebody. The delay is just too long. We're losing too much information. There's too big of a gap in the sounds going back and forth. And one of the last applications you need to think about for high speed and very efficient performance of your network are video applications. They're not only latency sensitive, they're also extremely high bandwidth. So you've probably seen this. If you've got a slow connection to YouTube, suddenly these videos aren't working so well for you. You're constantly buffering and waiting for something to get buffered to your machine so you can at least have some decent user experience. If you are having a lot of delays and your bandwidth is very low, that video application is not going to work very well. So now we know why we would want to optimize the network. How can we go about optimizing the network? Well, let's start with one called high availability. If we're designing a network from the ground up, we would want to put components in place that were designed to be up all the time. We don't want anything to ever fail. And so if something that we're putting in has a high level of availability, it's going to have things like a high 99.999% uh, uptime. Now, you'll, you'll hear that a lot. You'll hear the industry, this particular technology has five nines of reliability. And that refers to the five nines that are in that 99.999% uptime. But when you start thinking about five nines is not a lot of downtime. That's up a lot of the time. If we take an entire year, 365 days, which is, of course, 24 hours in a day and 60 minutes in every hour, that's 525,600 minutes a year of 100% uptime. So if we look at 0.001% of that, that's about five minutes of downtime. That means that device is designed to essentially never go down. It's going to be up and running 
uh, five minutes or less of downtime in a year. That's that's amazing. That's remarkable. And in many cases, that's a little bit crazy. You're not going to get that in most devices. There are some like phone switches that never go down. You pick up the phone, you get a dial tone. They're just always there. Very much high availability. If you're running a Windows web server, probably not the same level of high availability. And now you can start to understand why the types of technologies you put in may be different depending on what your requirements are for that availability. Now, when you put in something that is high availability, it's probably going to be high expensive. It's probably going to be a lot of dollars thrown into that. And there's probably another contingency to add into the mix. For instance, if you're buying a server, you may want to make sure it has multiple power supplies in case one fails. So that's a high availability server. Maybe it's got higher quality hard drive components in it. So the more, the higher quality you're going to have, the more it's going to cost you, generally speaking. And you have to think about that nothing is going to be 100% up by itself. There's always going to be something else involved. There's going to be power connections. That phone switch is going to connect to a telephone on your desk. That phone switch is going to connect to your, your internet, your private service provider, your phone service provider. You got to make sure they're up as much as your switch is up. So there's all these different components. It's never something in a vacuum. So you always have to think about what are the external influences on this being available. Because high availability and it being available all that time doesn't necessarily mean that there's any fault tolerance there. If our phone switch fails for five minutes during the year, that's still five minutes. I'm without a phone switch. I don't have another phone switch sitting somewhere that can pick up the, the pace there. When it's down, it's down. So there may be some cases where we'd also like to add some redundancy. And then we get into a completely different situation. Just because it's high availability doesn't mean it's never, of course, going to fail for us. So we have to think about creating some type of tolerant environment. And a fault tolerant environment means that if we do have a failure, we at least continue to work. We're still up and running. So when a problem occurs, what happens? Does the network fail over to a completely separate set of equipment? Do we have a separate power supply in case one fails? When this happens, of course, there could be a problem with performance. We may be degrading the performance of what we're doing because everybody who might be sharing a link, when that other link failed, everybody now fails over and you've put twice the load on the link that it was prior to that. So this doesn't always mean it's going to run perfectly should we have some type of fault. Now, the fault tolerance also adds a little bit of complexity. As we add more devices, we duplicate devices, we add separate routes to connections. Now we have to think about how we're going to manage all of this. And it, there are technologies and protocols in use that will fail over properly once a failover happens. And so there's a cost involved in, in increasing this complexity. We also have to think about single devices. You know, we've, we've talked about RAID. We've done redundant power, redundant NIC cards. Just how redundant do you need a server to be? Do you have a completely separate server? And should that server fail, you move the wires over and plug it into the new server? It's not beyond the, the, the realm of possibility. Certainly, companies do that all the time. It just depends. Is the business case here such that if I buy another server, it will be worth the money if there's a problem. And that's a business decision that your organization has to make for itself. And of course, multiple fault tolerance. We have all the time people that have server farms. There's load balancing. There's multiple network paths. There's many ways to do fault tolerance. Let's step through a couple scenarios on what people are doing on fault tolerance. One thing is that they're doing load balancing. Load balancing, a very common way to balance the load between different servers. If you've got a cluster of servers down here, you can have one or many load balancers and you can lose any one of these servers down here. You see this all the time in environments that have to stay up and running. It's a big environment. They need to make sure these things are always there. And it, this is great because if during the middle of the day, if they decide that they need to reboot a server, they just reboot it. The other three servers are there picking up the load. So they can reboot that server, it gets back online, and everything's back the way it was. And as long as there wasn't a huge amount of people coming in needing access to servers during that time frame, you were just fine. So already, we're seeing where fault tolerance can really help us with throughput and redundancy. When I say building out a redundant and fault tolerant network creates complexities, I wanted to give you a feel for how this happens. This is a very common network where I have an internet connection through a firewall to a router, maybe have a core switch, and to my core switch is a web server. So a very simple diagram of how that is. But let's say that while I'm working on this network, I realize that firewall for me is a single point of failure. And I want to keep my network uptime to the internet up all the time. Very important for my business. So I'll put in another firewall. 
Well, here we're already getting complex. We know that our internet provider, we need another link from our internet provider to that firewall. We need this firewall to be able to talk to the other firewall so that they both know what's going on. And that firewall also has to report back in to my core router back here on the back side. So now I've got a lot of different protocols in place. The firewalls themselves probably have a way to either fail over from one to the other, or they may both be active at the same time. So already a challenge with management. My next place where I may have problems then is this core router. If I want to make sure everything's going to get back to my switch, I need to put another router in place. So now I've got even more links. Look at all these. This is the Noah's Ark of networking. You start adding two by two by two. This is not an unusual type configuration. Almost everybody's decently sized network has this kind of redundancy built into it with multiple firewalls, multiple routers, and multiple switches. And you can even go the next step. I have a single web server back here. We were just talking about load balancing. Let's stick a load balancer in there as well. It's not very uncommon to very easily go from one side to the other, even putting in a completely separate internet provider with a completely separate link into my firewall. And depending on what you're doing, maybe you provide services across the internet. This is exactly what you want. You need to think about from a business perspective how much money you're going to spend to be able to get this level of fault tolerance and because you can just keep going. Maybe I want to have multiple power supplies. Maybe I need these routers to have multiple redundant routers right behind them. If you've got money, you can certainly throw at the problem, but you have to make a business decision about how far you go and where you're going to stop. An increasingly popular way to improve network efficiency is to integrate a traffic shaping or quality of service device onto the network. And what this is designed to do is prioritize the traffic going across the network based on the application that happens to be communicating. For instance, voice over IP traffic is very sensitive to latency. So you never want to have somebody doing a big file transfer or going out to YouTube and making it so that you can't talk on the phone anymore. You may also have certain applications that you want to be sure get a certain amount of bandwidth or a certain data rate going through the network. And they're always going to be at that bandwidth regardless of whatever else might be going on. You'll hear this often referred to as a quality of service. You're providing people with a quality of service. And that's the process that you're using for controlling the traffic that's going through your network. This could be based on a traffic shaping engine, a piece of hardware that's in your network. You may be doing weighting or load balancing with separate load balance servers. You may be doing management at the protocol level using some separate bytes and bits of the protocol's class of service and type of service are common words that you will hear associated with the manipulation or the tunneling of IP protocols across the network. The way this would look is a picture like this. So the green network is the amount of bandwidth available on our network. If nothing else is happening, then we've given certain applications that have said, if you got the bandwidth, use all of it. And those are the blue apps right here. And as long as nothing else is happening on the network, the blue apps, they use as much as they would like. Now, as soon as I have a higher priority application start to use the network, it starts to use up to a certain amount that I may have configured. My blue application is going to drop down and allow this other application to have that bandwidth. So already you're starting to see the traffic shaper can come in pretty handy so that blue traffic doesn't overwhelm anything. What if you had an application on your network that should always have priority? Doesn't matter. It always is number one. And maybe voice over IP is that application. So you have this expedite forward function. And this expedite forward means that it is number one. And as soon as that, that red application begins, everybody else drops down and red ends up getting all the bandwidth until such time that more frees up and blue can, of course, go back to what it was doing. And then finally, when the red app is done, blue can go all the way back up again. The only way you'd be able to make this happen is if you had some type of traffic shaping technology in place. There's just no other way to manage this. Protocols use however much they want, as much as they want. And you need to be able to think about and manage how you're going to have these classes, what they're going to be set to, the priorities they have, and how we're going to implement it in our environment. Another way to control the type of efficiencies we get, especially over very limited links to the internet, is through something called caching engines. This is also useful so that if we wanted to uh, be able to control traffic, we could even do it through here. But from a performance perspective, we're going to talk about caching and how that works. For instance, let's say this user A over here wanted to go to Google. Now, nobody else during the day has gone there yet. He's coming in the morning, and he does a Google search, and it goes out to Google somewhere out on the internet. Google takes that 
first page, he went to google.com and sends back the google.com web page directly back to user A. But before it gets to user A, the cache, which is sitting in the middle, says, oh, you're going to Google? I haven't been there today. Let me get a copy of that before I send it on its way. I'm going to put a local copy in here and give you a copy of that. Now, that's useful by itself because what happens is that user B comes in during the day and says, oh, I need to go to Google as well. But instead of sending him all the way out that slow internet connection, he simply goes to the cache and the cache provides him with that page. There's a lot of different parameters we can put in the cache that limit how long it keeps a page, the types of pages, and what's going on. But at a very high level, that's exactly the way a cache works. And you can see that user B used zero bandwidth out to the internet, leaving everything else able to do whatever it needed to do in and out of that internet connection. A very common cache that you see that's open source is one called Squid. That's a great name, isn't it? It's often combined together with a, a caching and proxy type service. And the, the problem with any type of caching, Squid, or anything else is that they aren't going to cache dynamic web pages or, or pages that are doing streaming media. There's just no way to cache those things and keep that much bandwidth, that much traffic on a caching server. So Squid's a very good example of how you can use uh, an open source solution to do this type of bandwidth management, this type of network efficiency monitoring so that you can save, save time, save money, and save efficiency of these networks and make them more available to the applications that really need to use them. Let's review what we've learned with these network performance optimization technologies. What would be a good reason for optimizing network performance? There's a big list of them that we did at the beginning. And if you answered uptime, high bandwidth apps, latency sensitive apps, voice over IP, or video, you'd be right on the money. Those are great reasons for making sure that your network runs as efficiently as possible. Next question, which technology creates local copies of content to avoid multiple requests over these slow and in many cases, relatively expensive links. Well, that was the technology we were just looking at called a caching engine. And that was what we looked at when we were looking at Squid. What technology can prioritize traffic based on application type? And a prioritization of application is done with traffic shaping and with something called quality of service. Either one of those is a good example of prioritizing traffic. Well, that is the network performance optimization module for us, where we've gone through rationales and exactly how you would go about implementing different methods for network performance optimization. We've got many more Network Plus videos. We have message boards. You can send me an email. Just visit our website, freenetworkplus.com.